Hey everyone, and welcome to the Christ Family Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you've decided to join us virtually, and we hope that you will be blessed in this teaching. We're in a sermon series right now called The Table, where we are looking at the theme of the table throughout scripture and um, seeing what it means. And today our scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, there is a Lucan uh, scholar, he says, if you're reading the Gospel of Luke and you don't get hungry, you're reading it wrong because Jesus is either coming from a meal, at a meal, or on his way to a meal. And it shows us this theme. And so normally when Jesus is eating with um, people who are not Christians, I, I notice this theme. He doesn't talk with her, or people who are not Jewish people, people who they may have said were sinners. He didn't really talk that much. He listened. But today we have a feast that Jesus is at where he talks and he talks a lot. He actually calls out the, um, the person who is putting on this feast, and, um, and it's sort of rife with drama. I wouldn't recommend you going to someone's feast and calling out their guest list, um, but this is the savior of the world. So uh, it, many times it's like, you know, what would Jesus do? Don't follow Jesus's example here, unless the Holy Spirit's really moving in you. But we're going to be in Luke 14, starting at chapter 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or banquet, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, because when you invite them, they invite you in return, you will be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, invite the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they can't repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. You'll be repaid in eternity when you see God. When one of these who reclined at the table heard him, he said to him, blessed is everybody who will eat bread in the kingdom of God, or at least that's how I have read it before. It's sort of like he's just quoting like a Bible verse he knows. And um, it says, then Jesus said to him, a man once gave a great banquet, invited many, and at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to everybody who had been invited, come, everything's now ready, ring the dinner bell. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I, I bought a field, I, I have to go out and see it, right? Uh, please have me excused. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen. I don't know how many that is, but you know, it seems like a lot. I'll go examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I, I just got married. I've got a wife. She's at home. She wants me there with her. So sorry, I cannot come. Okay. The, the wonderful wife excuse, um, which I'm sure none of you guys have ever used ever. But the servant came to and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry, he said to his servant, I want you to go out quickly to the streets, the lanes of the city. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded I have done, but still there's room. So the master said to the servant, I want you to go out even further. Go out to the highways and the hedges. Compel people to come in that my house may be filled. In this we see the heart of the Father wanting eternity, heaven, his home to be filled. For I tell you, none of these men who are invited shall taste my banquet. Will you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit, move in our hearts and our midst. Uh, open our eyes to see your goodness. Open our ears to hear your truth. And Jesus, would you um, open our hearts to receive the message that you have for us today? Father, I pray that you would speak to all of us and um, in our own place in life and um, move us to fullness and wholeness as disciples of you. Um, Father, I lift up all of those who made a profession and were baptized today. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to lead them and guide them and instill your truth within them. It's in the matchless name of Christ we pray. And everyone said? Amen. All right. So if you have a TV or a smartphone or anything that connects you to the news, you will know what is going on, right? I hear it all the time, Trump and Harris. Need I say more? I'm not going to say any more. Don't worry. This is not a political sermon. But regardless of where you stand politically or theologically, I think we can all agree that our world seems more divided than ever before. There are people who are unwilling to hear the side of another person. And in my vast 34 years of living, I don't believe I've ever experienced the polarity of our world that we have today. I mean, progressive and conservative, Democrat and Republican, black and white, LGBTQ, straight, urban, rural, rich and poor, West Coast, East Coast, or like we have in the Midwest, no coast, baby, right? All the way down the list. Is there, though, a practice from the way of Jesus and from his life that can help bridge the great divide? Is there a way that engenders our hearts uh, for a po our polarized, angry, and over-the-top anxious society? A practice that tears down the walls between us and them and what the writers of the New Testament called the wall of hostility. Is there a way for us to look at our enemy and turn them into our friend and a stranger and turn them into our brother and our sister? Is there away from Jesus' life and his teachings? I think the answer is yes. 
For the past few weeks, we've had this sermon series on the table, and I've preached about the wonderfulness of God's table. And the thing is, the table, it has the ability to bring people together. It's this wonderful place, but also, I believe on the flip side, it can be used for not so great things. The table can use, be used to divide. Think about it. Has there ever been a table you were excluded from? Did you ever not get invited to Easter, okay? My wife was an ICU nurse during COVID. We didn't get invited to Easter, okay? No slide on the family. It's okay. She was scary. We had germs. Um, but were you ever excluded from a table? Maybe there was a meeting table in a conference room that you were excluded from. Maybe it was the dinner table, a party that you were excluded from and not invited to. Or maybe it's a table of an old friend that you used to sit at and you miss them. Maybe there has become a division there or they're no longer here. How did you feel in the moment when you were excluded, left out, right? Probably not that great. The table, it's a place where we can be bridged together, but it's also a place where prominence can be exhibited. Think about it. Who sits at the head of your table, right? Um, I don't know about you. My, when I was growing up with my grandparents, we had a circular table. We all had uh, assigned spots. And whenever my sister sat in my spot that one time, I got so mad at her. I was like, this is my chair. Who sits, uh, you know, normally it's like, okay, this is where we sit. Someone comes in for dinner and they have to ask the unspoken, like, where, where can I sit? And you're like, that chair right there. That's the only one. Everywhere else is assigned. Is this kindergarten? No, but it might as well be. The table, it's a place to exhibit prominence. As a kid, did your father always sit at the head of the table? So when you had a table of your own, you're like, this is where I'm going to sit. This is my seat. That's why according to our story, or uh, according to a story, not our story, but King Arthur's knights had a round table so that there wasn't jockeying for position. But I'm sure there was still that there because we have this innate desire to be in a prominent position. Well, I get to sit. Uh, yeah, we're all equal at this table, but I sit on the right hand of King Arthur. I sit on the left side of it. Um, who is sitting closest to King Artie? Our prominence and position, it's shown in the table many times. And right before our scripture today, there were people vying for the good spot. They were getting their elbows out. They're like, I'm going to sit at the head of the table. I'm going to sit closest to this guy. And then Jesus calls them out. He sits back. He said, hey, um, you should sit at the least place and then hope to get called up. For middle schoolers or high schoolers in this room, you have a table that you are probably about to go to, the lunch table. Do you remember that? Thank God I'm not in high school anymore. I made my friends mad one day. I was like, I don't even want to go to the lunchroom. Where am I going to sit, you know, with the art kids? It's funny because I was an art kid. Okay, choir one. Sad reality. So at that point, I had nowhere else to go. I wasn't accepted anywhere. But um, the middle school table or the high school table, it's a place of prominence. Are you sitting with the sports kids? Are you sitting with the choir kids? Thank goodness we are not in high school anymore for those of us who are grown up. But again, a reference to the table here is not just a piece of wood with four legs. There is a sign of status within the table. For many, it's a place of contention, but Jesus brings an alternative view to the table, one of humility, one of grace, one of a table not filled with prominent people who are vying for their great position, but a table filled with outcasts, lame, blind, broken people, people who don't have a title before their name, people who we may not even ever know their name. And in, Jesus, in this scripture today, Jesus is at a meal, and he begins calling out people for their ridiculousness, saying, why are you trying to get in a place of prominence? Sit down, chill out. And then he critiques the guest list of the Pharisee whose table he eats at. He says, guys, don't invite those who have a, you have a, an affinity for. Don't invite the rich people. Invite the poor, the crippled, the blind. And then at the end of this life, you'll be repaid. Verse 12, he also said to the man who had been invited, when you give a dinner or a banquet, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. Don't just invite the people that you like, lest they also, uh, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. How many of you have done that in the past week? I know as I was reading this scripture, I was like, oh, man, I should probably start doing that a little bit more. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. We have been trained all the time to ask, what would Jesus do? WWJD, you probably worn a bracelet or had a shirt with it on there. I would not recommend, though, doing what Jesus did, critiquing somebody at the table you have been invited to, okay? Then this one guy leans in and he says, yeah, blessed is everybody who eats bread in the kingdom of God. It sort of shows that he's comprehending it a little bit. He's like, okay, yeah, you know, um, I, I've, I get to talk with people who are not Christians, and when they find out I'm a pastor, they're like, yeah, uh, 
Psalm 23, I learned it when I was like six years old in, in Sunday school, and they try and quote it. I'm like, you don't have to do that. It's okay. We can just talk about sports or something that you like. I don't like that, but you know, um, I, I, it's okay. I won't get distracted there. But he's trying to show that he's comprehending what Jesus is saying, but I wonder if there was humor in that. If the man, while trying to show that he was listening, was actually sucking up to Jesus in that moment, not listening to what Jesus had told him to do. And then Jesus goes into a story of a great feast, and he started off by inviting all of his friends. Maybe he was having a housewarming party, or his kid had just graduated, and he wanted to invite everybody. What scholars believe, though, this is akin to a wedding celebration feast. The food was ready. The table was set. In it, there was one of those fat pigs with an apple in it. The drinks were poured. There was, you know, bread pudding, which I don't know why people like it, but they have it, okay? It's great. And he opens the door, and he says, hey, come on in. Ding, 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 dinner time. We got the food. And everybody who was invited to the feast says, no, thank you. It's, it's okay. Well, they texted last minute. They said, sorry, something came up. Oh, my stomach, it's, it's upset. I must have ate something wrong. They emailed him, said, sorry, we just got a new puppy, got to feed the dogs, or my tummy hurts, or all the excuses that any of us could come up with at any moment, um, because most of us have come up with an excuse this week. And you know what they say about excuses. They are just like I won't finish that, but you can finish it. My wife didn't know that, so if anybody would like to teach her what that saying was. However, everyone comes up with excuses for the invitation. Verse 17, at that time, the banquet, he sent his servant, hey, come on in, 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a field. I must go and see it, okay? Please have me excused. Another said, I bought my five yoke of oxen. Another, please have me excused. And another said, I just married my wife, therefore I can't come. Obviously, we see Jesus' sense of humor here. The excuses seem a little ridiculous. You just bought a field and you have to go see it, right? Or you just got married. What we see here is that everybody has excuses. They had RSVP'd. They'd sent in their reply or their plus one. And then the last moment, everyone cancels. The word here for excuses in the Greek, it's paratomai. And it sounds relatively harmless, right? Oh, they just gave their excuse. What it means deeply, though, is that they rejected their invitation. They didn't just give an excuse. They weren't just saying, sorry, I got other commitments. They were rejecting the invitation to the feast. And I mean, I was thinking about it, right? If somebody invited me to a feast in this economy, I would not reject it. I'd be like, yeah, come on, Brit, I will come over. Can I take it to go box home as well? Awesome. Amen. God bless you. However, these people turn it down. They say, have me excused. They reject it. Something came up, but they don't realize the implications because this isn't just a normal table. This table is a picture of heaven. And they're not just rejecting dinner. They're rejecting dinner with the creator of the universe, with God himself. Moving on, the master of the uh, dinner, the house, he becomes enraged. The food's getting cold. So he says to his servant, run, get everybody, get the outcasts, the, the least of these, get them here to the table. We don't have refrigerators. There will not be leftovers. Come on, get, bring them in. And there is a bit of an ominous ending. For I tell you, none of these men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Seems a little dark, right? Seems a little ominous there. Uh, Jesus, they, they just gave excuses, right? They were rejecting God's invitation. It's scary here that those who turned away God's invitation to the table, they'll never taste his banquet at the end of eternity. But that's where our calling comes from, Christ's family church. That's where you and I, we shine. God had invited the Jews to the feast. God had set up a table for them. He had come down from heaven in human form in the person of Jesus, and he was before them, sitting next to them. And instead of listening to God, they proclaimed to love. They argued with him and schemed against him. They did not want to eat at Jesus' table. So what does God do? He says, go out and invite everybody to the table. Invite all of those, the outcast, the broken, the lame. We don't have refrigerators. There won't be leftovers. There isn't time for it later down the line. It's here, and it's now, and your invitation is here. So get them to the table, and let's eat. Let's sit across from each other, and let's turn strangers into family. Here we see the revocation of the Jewish people's invitation and the beginning of God's invitation widening to the rest of the world, which is good because I only know of one person in our church who was born into the Jewish lineage. Um, but Paul speaks of this in Acts. It says, Paul and Barnabas, they spoke out saying, it was necessary for the word of God to be spoken first to you, the Jews. But then guess what? Since you thrust it aside, since you gave excuses, since you rejected the invitation to the table and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, 
We're turning to the Gentiles. We're opening up the table. We're saying, come one, come all. You got a broken past. You were never raised in the church. Come one and all because the table of Jesus is open to you. The grace of Jesus Christ is here for you. All you got to do is come to the table. Say yes. Drop your excuses at the door and come and say, Jesus, I'm here. Will you come and live in my life? So now you and I are invited in. We are part of the family, partakers of the feast, or at least we have the opportunity to come to the table. Imagine it. Uh, Jesus comes down right now and he says, hey, uh, Caden, will you come and eat with me? I'm going to Jersey Mike's after this, okay? The best sandwiches in the Quad Cities, okay? It's better than Jimmy, whatever the places are. It's awesome. Will you come and eat with me? And then you're like, oh, sorry, I got, man, I, I was going to, you know, paint my toenails afterwards. Sorry, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I got things coming up. Can, can we reschedule it? Uh, rain check at all, right? I don't think any of us would turn that down if Jesus was right in front of us saying, come and eat with me. I think and hope the majority in this room and in this church would say, yes, you would cancel your plans for Jesus. But on the flip side, how many of us didn't do that this week? How many of us came up with excuses? Oh, oh, man, I know I should sit down and read my Bible, but I've just got too much going on. Jesus, I feel your Holy Spirit moving in me to pray and to talk with you, but I'm just, I'm so overwhelmed. I, I can't talk with you. I know this should be the exact time that I come to you, but man, there's so much going on, Jesus. Or when someone you work with, they're in a dark place and you feel the Holy Spirit move on you to tell them about the hope of Jesus Christ and, and tell them about how God can lead them and guide them into truth and we just come up with an excuse. Oh, I'm not eloquent or I don't, I don't know that much. I haven't read all the books in the Bible. How many of us this week have come up with an excuse? We look at the people in this story and we're like, oh man, they messed up. They missed their opportunity. But how many of us have come up with an excuse, a parotomai, a rejection of God and his invitation to the feast this week? Because it's easy for us to overlook our own failures to say yes to God's invitation. But question, will you like those before you, give excuses and end up rejecting God? And how have you rejected God lately? I want to close with three points. Two of them I have for Christians in the room, and um, the third one I have is for those who are not Christians in the room. But I'd ask you to uh, lean in on this. I know we're a little bit over time. The baptisms went a little long, but it's for a good reason. It was amazing. But my first point is for Christians in the room. Number one, I would ask that you make God's table a priority. Make God's table a priority. How are you saying no to God's invitation today? How are you even checking out in this message thinking, oh, you know, I said yes to Jesus a really long time ago. I don't have to do it daily. Yes, you do. Open your Bible again. Pray to God again. Do you remember the joy that you first had when you f sat at God's table, when you realized you were called to be part of his kingdom, when you realized that he had pulled you out of the kingdom of darkness and brought you to his kingdom of life? that he had wiped away every sin you had ever done and he saw you just as he saw his own son. Get back to that. Say yes to God again. Begin believing in his kingdom again because the world needs you and they need you to say yes and then also to start sharing your faith. My second point is invite all to God's table. The servant of the master, he went out and he went to everybody that he could find and he came back, he said, okay, I did it. There's still more room. And then the master said, go out further. I want you to go to the least of these. Go out to the, um, to the streets. Go out outside of the uh, limits of the four quad cities. Go to the fifth one over there, okay? The Hamptons, they need somebody over there as well. It says, verse 22, and the servant said, sir, what you commanded has been done. There's still room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways, the hedges, and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. I love that word there, go. Church, you and I are not called to a complacent faith. You and I are not just called to sit in this pew. We are called to go. Jesus echoes the same words in his call in Matthew 28 when he says, go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. You and I, there is a verb attached to our faith, to go, to go and invite others to the table because there are people outside of our four walls right now just like some of the men and women who got baptized today who don't know that they are invited to God's feast, who haven't gotten their, the email from Jesus that had you know, the invitation that went to their spam folder. They are famished, they are feeble, dying, considering taking their own life and to end their pain. And you have the answer. 
You have the hope that they need, and it is found only in Jesus. It is found at his table. So invite them to church. Invite them to come and sit with you. Invite them to the life change that comes from knowing Jesus. Stop looking at their sin. Stop giving excuses, but instead get out there and go and start inviting everybody to the table. Start looking at them with the love of Jesus. A few weeks ago, um, we went to Aldi really quickly, and um, I ran in, and my wife kept driving the car around because if the wheels stop moving, our 10-month-old starts crying, okay? And she, she, uh, I went in. I, I got the stuff we need. I'm in the checkout line, and my wife calls me. And I don't know what it is. She always calls me at the most inopportune times. So I'm literally there at the checkout line doing the self-checkout because it's, it's more efficient. I'm quicker than everybody else if I do it, right? And she calls me, and I'm like, oh, what is it, you know? And I answer it, and she's like, hey, honey, I saw a homeless woman out here in the parking lot. Uh, I, I uh, spoke with her and I invited her over to dinner. Is that okay? And I was like, yeah, of course, that's awesome. She's like, okay, good, because that's what I told the lady. She was like, uh, is it okay with your husband? She was like, yeah, he's a pastor. He gets really happy about these things, So, um, they, which is a little odd, you know. Um, and so we came home. We were so excited. Blair started getting the bathroom ready. She was getting dinner ready. She was like, okay, if she needs a shower, she can get ready there. We'll get her a phone charger, everything that she needs. Um, she closed off the backyard so her dog could be back there. And, um, and then the thing is, she texted Blair uh, after we'd gotten ready, and she gave an excuse. She said, oh, I can't come. Or She gave an excuse, and we were bummed. We were so excited to serve God in this way. And it struck me whether or not she came, though, that's on her. That's her choice to make. It was our job, our duty as followers of Jesus to invite her to the table. We had done what was right in saying yes to God, extending the invitation. But too many of us in the church are afraid of getting rejected to invite others to the table. But remember, whether or not they accept or not, that's not on you. You have done your part. Uh, that's on them, as my therapist constantly reminds me. We can only do what we can do. So um, many, many gave excuses to God. Many today give excuses to God. The one who didn't, though, was the servant. He, was, um, he did as the master said. He went and brought others to the table. And you and I, if you are a Christian, are called to do the same, to invite others to the table of Jesus, to invite others to the life change that comes only through Christ. Christians in the room, number one, make God's table a priority. And number two, invite all to the table. Church, I know that the last one sounds big and scary, but start small. Start with your friends or your family. Reach out to them. Text them and say, how can I pray for you this week? Or invite them over to dinner. Pull out the sermon discussion questions from this week, which will be up at the end, and uh, talk about them over the table. The thing is, you don't have to go to a street corner. Just start with inviting them to your table. If you're a Christian in this room, I, if you are not a Christian in this room, I want to take a moment, though, to invite you to God's table. It was around the table that I met a young man, extended the same invitation to him, I told him that God had prepared a feast for him and that he would like to see him there. And I repeat those same words to you. God has prepared a feast for you, a heavenly feast prepared there. There's a place for you at his table. And no matter the excuses that you can come up with, no matter the things that you can say, oh, I'm not worthy or I'm too far gone, there's still a place for you and God wants you at his table. And you might have excuses. I'm not smart. I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy, but I stand up here. I'm the chief of all the sinners. I am the king of all failures. The biggest mess up there has ever been. Man, I, the people still today from like my high school go, you're a pastor? I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's very unlikely for me. I didn't ever think that I would be here, right? But I said yes to God's call, to his invitation. And I want to ask you, will you stop making excuses and say yes to the invitation of God? Will you say yes? Will you uh, contact us, meet with one of us this week, one of our staff members? who desire to bring you into the table, to the feast. In uh, Revelation, there is this wonderful picture of the end time, of what's going to happen for those of us who have said yes, who don't come up with excuses, but go fully into God's kingdom. And I want to read that for you, this beautiful picture. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder. They were crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, He reigns. Let us rejoice, let us exalt, let us give God the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride, who is the church, has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Verse nine, the angel said to me, write this, Make sure people get this, okay? I want you to make sure. 
that people one day, 2,000 years later, in Davenport, Iowa, are going to hear this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Today, you're invited to the feast. You're invited to God's table. Not just to a table here on earth, but in a table in, with all eternity, with everyone who has ever come before us, who believes and professes Jesus Christ. You're invited to come and to meet at that table. Here we see the marriage supper of the Lamb where believers are gathered at the heavenly table and celebrate the union of Christ in the church. This is the hope that all those who got baptized to have, that one day we will see Jesus and sit at his table, that we are invited to spend eternity with him and should not be living our lives just for the here and now but live our lives with our eyes set on eternity, on this beautiful table where we get to sit across from Jesus and see a little piece of beard, uh, uh, see a little piece of bread in his beard as he just laughs and says, I'm so glad you're here dining with me. If you're not a Christian in the room, your job is to do what Cohen did in that video. Come to the table. Give it a try. Okay, I, I love what he said. He, well, first off, he said, the sermons weren't that boring, you know, or very boring. I was like, okay, cool, thanks, I'll take that. But the second thing that he said was, you know, if you're not a Christian in this room, give it a try. What do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? Stop with the excuses and come to the table because life change happens when we accept God's invitation. And I believe God can change your life. He can take the broken parts of your life and make them whole. He can change your life through the power of his Holy Spirit as you turn to him from sin. Tonight, today, if you would like to connect with us, we have a QR code there. If you would like to learn what it means to sit at God's table, to um, make a profession of faith, to have your life changed by him, I'd encourage you to uh, follow that uh, connect card there, um, the QR code. But also, each week we come up with discussion questions because we don't just want this to be a sermon that goes in one ear and out the other. We want this to be something that you can apply to your life ri richly and deeply. And so there are discussion questions there um, or our church center app on the homepage where you can sit down at a meal with your friends and your family and talk about them. Because guess what? If you've invited somebody who's not a Christian to your table, I don't think they're going to turn down answering a few questions, right? As long as the food's good. And I know we have some really good co cooks in this church. So I'd encourage you, would you um, connect with us? Would you find out what it truly means to follow Jesus? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this day, for your life and your love. And I thank you that you have invited us to your table in heaven to spend eternity with you, Jesus, and um, to sit across from you. We are welcome and we are called to partake in this. And Jesus, I thank you for those who have made a profession today, for those who have shown um, all of us the life change that can happen through Jesus Christ. And Jesus, it's in your words that we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, again, we hope that you enjoyed that teaching from Christ Family Church. If you'd like to join us in person sometime, we meet every single Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And if you'd like to learn more about our church, you can visit us online at ChristFamilyChurch.org. Thanks for watching. Thank you.